So it's the 1570s, and the story goes that Edward Lord Clinton, the Lord High Admiral of England, was mulling about um, doing a spot of redecorating. Um, here he is in Hans Holbein's sketch, looking pretty dapper in his youth. Um, here he is a few years later, looking perhaps not quite so dapper, alas. Uh, but never mind that. So um, the, the thing he needed to have, he decided, was a series of painted panels um, describing the costumes of people around the globe. Now, as far as Tudor redecoration or home decoration ideas go, this isn't particularly radical. Um, he was in pretty safe place. Um, painted panels were fairly common and costume books were a new and fashionable thing to have. So that's all good. It's also appropriately outward looking, one would think, for someone who's the head of the Royal Navy, except that the final panel was supposed to look something like this. The panels haven't survived, but this one matches contemporary descriptions and comes from a manuscript book of costumes, um, which was painted by the same artist, a Flemish immigrant artist called Lucas de Heer, um, roughly around the same time. Um, so, the rest of the story is probably best told by an eyewitness. And this is pretty much as close to an eyewitness as we can get. Um, Lucas's pupil, um, Carol Mander wrote a collection of lives of famous Dutch artists, and this is the story as he got it from the artist himself. When all but the Englishman were done, he painted him naked and set, him beside, set beside him all manner of cloth and silk materials, and next to them, tailor's scissors and chalk. When the admiral, that's Edward Clinton, saw this figure, he asked Lucas what he meant by it. He answered that he had done that with the Englishman because he didn't know what appearance or kind of clothing he should give him because they varied so much from day to day. For if he had done it one way today, the next day it would have to be another, be it French or Italian, Spanish or Dutch, and I have therefore painted the material and tools to hand so that one can always make of it one, what one wishes. It seems a bit of a risky move by Lucas de Heer, doesn't it? This indictment of his host nation. But it's an old joke, and it had done the rounds before him. Here it is in an English book um, called The Introduction of Knowledge by Andrew Board, which was published in 1550s, but written in the de decade before that. Um, but the thing is that Board's naked Englishman had plenty of similarly sartorially confused friends all over Europe. The Germans and the Venetians cracked exactly the same joke about their own fashion conscious gentry. And look, in this costume book printed in Nuremberg about the same time, the naked man is labeled Europe as a whole, approaching a Persian nobleman representing Asia, a Brazilian warrior representing the Americas, um, and a Moorish soldier representing Africa. They're all dressed in their own traditional clothing, and they all kind of look like they deeply regret inviting him to the party. <laughs> um, anyway, Lucas's ex-student tells us that the Lord High Admir Admiral was amused and told Queen Elizabeth but the queen, like her famous successor later on, was not amused at all. And there is every indication that suggests that there is some truth to this particular story, because Lucas's joke was, in fact, um, mentioned in a particular sermon, the homily against excess of apparel that Elizabeth commanded to be preached in every English church roughly around this particular point. And it is essentially a caveat against the sartorial decadence and frivolity of Englishmen. 
therefore a certain man that would picture every countryman in his accustomed apparel, the homily goes, pictured the Englishman all naked and gave him cloth under his arm and bade him to make it himself, for he changed his fashion so often. Thus, with our fantastical devices, we make ourselves laughing stocks to other nations. Today, um, I want to use Lucas and his joke to think about the way England's global trade and encounters and England's identity or emergent identity, sense of itself as a nation engaged with each other in a period we tend to think of as a quintessentially English golden age, an age that struck out and created its own identity on its own terms. The man whose 500th anniversary we are celebrating through this lecture series, Sir Thomas Gresham, is in many ways representative of what was unique about England's relationship with an expanding world. In that particular historical moment, he was a merchant rather than a statesman, but trade and money, which always helps, um, made him more powerful than many of the highest courtiers of his times. He was someone whose fortunes and connections were built in Europe, but whose most notable intervention in the form of the building of the Royal Exchange in London posed a very deliberate and self-conscious English alternative um, to the Bourse in Antwerp, which was the hub of Northern European trade. Lucas, by the way, admired Sir Thomas Gresham greatly. Um, he wrote this very long poem in praise of Gresham and the Royal Exchange, roughly around the same time when he was going around painting naked Englishmen and annoying queens as a result. But what was Gresham's world really like? What were the relationships it harbored between movements outward and movements in, between the outward-looking Greshams, so to say, and the incoming Lucases, and the thousands of others who were traveling in both directions, whose names we have forgotten? The age of travel and discovery was a period when cross-cultural encounters led to radical developments in the way we think about human and national identities. Human movement across borders increased under the combined kind of impact of political and economic um, and religious factors. And as they did, the way in which we think about difference between countries, between races, between human beings from this part of the world and human beings from another part of the world, those all developed rapidly as well and began to take recognizable shapes and forms. We are all too familiar, of course, with some of the concepts that either surfaced or evolved as a result of that. Terms like foreigner and stranger, alien or traitor or go-between. These are words that divide, that label and choose sides but they're also important because they demonstrate the incredible pull of what one historian, um, Mary Louise Pratt, has called contact zones, in-between spaces. These are spaces um, defined, as she puts it, not in terms of separateness or apartheid, but in terms of co-presence, interaction, interlocking understandings and practices. And of course, it's crucial to recognize that there were, of course, tensions and conflicts within these places. But what defines them above everything else is that no involved party emerges untouched from such exchanges. But I'd also suggest that such spaces weren't just geographical, but they were also temporally defined as well. In other words, they indicate not just contact in a particular place, a port city um, or a particular geographical area, but also in a particular historical moment. And what I hope we can do this evening is wander through a few stories that illuminate such movements of contact. And in the process, perhaps also illuminate aspects of a nation that was shaped as a result of those encounters. So 
one of the things that Lucas's joke highlights is the understanding that that dark little thread of anxiety running through all those jokes about, you know, sartorially confused Englishmen weren't unfounded. English tastes and fashions really were notably fast moving and all consuming in this period. And London, both as the heart of the court and of the political system, exemplified um, that as one particular 17th century antiquarian and historian of London observed, it was, he says, a city filled abundantly with all sorts of silks, fine linen, oils, wines and spices, perfection of arts and all costly ornaments and curious workmanship. And that's a crucial thing to recognize, I think, because people like Lucas or Thomas Gresham really did live in a period of remarkable change. And of course, that change or metamorphosis through human mobility, through human trade, wasn't limited to England alone. To many European subjects in the 16th century, it must have seemed like their world had gone larger and smaller at the same time. Astounding new geographical discoveries, faster ships, links to networks of trade and diplomacy, and above all, human mobility, some willing and some by force or sheer necessity, left their mark on European life and imagination in general. At first, England wasn't as caught up in these major global trends um, as, say, the Portuguese or the Spanish um, or the Venetians. But within 50 years or so, that position would change utterly. And we're talking basically, essentially within Thomas Gresham's lifetime. And in fact, a great early indicator of that change is um, Gresham's Royal Exchange, which opened in the city in the 1570s. Um, and this is a later etching, of course, Wenceslas Holler's 17th century etching of the Royal Exchange, which shows its main courtyard surrounded by two floors of shops. These were little cubicles, really, about five feet by seven feet. Um, but there were 120 of them. Shops like these were chock full of luxuries and imported goods, and those ranged from newly fashionable blue and white porcelain imported from China, which actually comes to England in the Tudor period, um, long before the 18th century craze for it, um, to textiles, gold Parisian buttons, Venetian looking glasses, Spanish shoes and hats, Italian perfumed gloves, Later, there would be beaver hats from North America, tobacco from Virginia, block printed cotton from India. We can gauge how central Gresham's exchange was in the changing cultural life of London and England in general by the fact that both Gresham and the Royal Exchange crop up multiple times on the public stage 20, 30, 40 years later. And of course, we all know that being a presence in popular culture surely is the zenith of a businessman's personal success. Um, so Gresham has a starring role too in his own time. Um, Gresham becomes a leading character in Thomas Haywood's not very snappily titled, If You Know Not Me, You Know Nobody. <laughs> Second part, it's a sequel. Um, in another play, Thomas Middleton's a chaste maid in Cheapside, a character very casually compares his pregnant wife's preference for trinkets to all the gaudy shops in Gresham's Burse. It all gives us a sense of how far Gresham's exchange had become the byword for English mercantile confidence, English appetite for the world, English propensity for conspicuous consumption. Um, as my students would say, in summary, English bling. A whole other lecture could be written about the material transformation of both English spaces and sociocultural lives through traffic and trade. However, my focus here is more on the people who were caught up in its wake. Because the burgeoning English confidence about the country's place in the world came with something else. It came with anxiety, and much of it 
was about that potential loss of identity. Lucas's joke, as I said, also opens up a little spy hole um, into that for us. Um, it illuminates the extent to which the flip side to the excitement of being open to the world for business was the fear of becoming an unwitting stooge for other people's jokes and other people's machinations. For better or for worse, immigrants like Lucas were integral parts of that unfolding double-edged story. Lucas was a Protestant. He was born in Ghent and became a refugee from the Dutch revolt against the Catholic um, Philip II of Spain. In many ways, he was what we might call a success story among the thousands of mainly Protestant religious refugees who escaped from Europe to England in repeated waves of migration. And this is a marker of one of the earliest of those waves. But between 1560 and 1570, there were over 5,000. So 5,000 in just a decade or so. And such waves would continue over the 16th and 17th centuries. Although the term immigrant doesn't really enter the English lexicon till much later, people in Tudor England would call them aliens or strangers. Lucas was a good immigrant. He fitted in. He was talented, prosperous, um, well-connected. And um, he essentially lived a fairly comfortable life, you could say, um, with his small household on Threadneedle Street. So that, just off Bishopsgate, is Threadneedle Street. Um, and in the decade Lucas spent in England, he would also become one of the elders of the Dutch Church of Austin Friars, just over there. Um, the biggest trouble he might have got into during that whole period while he was in England was probably when he was um, pulled up by the Dutch Church, actually, for not doing his duty towards his own community. In the church book of Austin Friars, um, in May 1573, there's a very curt note. It says, Lucas de Heer indicated that he had to earn his living, dealing with great masters, and he had to leave to serve them. Thereby, he had to neglect his community duties. This excuse, it records, was not found significant enough. Um, Lucas cultivated patrons, those great masters like Edward Clinton, made friends. He wrote that poem in praise of Gresham in the album Amicorum, or friendship book, of a fellow immigrant, um, a merchant humanist called Johannes Rademacher. And he went on antiquarian and sightseeing journeys occasionally. His um, sketch of Stonehenge, done sometime between 1573 and 1575, is acknowledged as one of the oldest depictions of Stonehenge in existence and the first to be drawn on sight. He also rose to be a painter of the English royal court. Um, and this is his um, Allegory of the Tudor Succession, a magnificent painting. Um, and he was entrusted with creating royal likenesses, just as a number of immigrant artists had done before him, like Hans Holbein, um, who painted Henry VIII, or Anthony van Dyck, who painted Charles the um, Second, um, uh, Charles the First, and. In London, Lucas would also do something else, which is train other young Netherlanders, other young Netherlandish artists. So he trained, we know John the Critz, who painted James I of England, James VI of Scotland, and possibly also um, Marcus Gerhertz, who painted this magnificent painting, the Ditchley portrait of Elizabeth I, standing on a map of England. So like them, he was a migrant maker of Englishness, of the collective national memories of English history. Others, like, unlike Lucas and Holbein, have let, left little or no traces of their existence. Um, this is a selection of the return of aliens, 
which is basically like a census or periodic list of people born overseas um, and resident in England, which was made during the 16th and 17th centuries. This is from 1571, the year Gresham's Royal Exchange opened. And if you look through the names, which you probably might not be able to do because it's quite small um, font, but you'll spot Flemish silk weavers, French embroiderers, Spanish preachers, husbands, wives, children, servants. In other parishes and in other cities, then and later, there would be African musicians and cooks, Japanese sailors, Native American translators, Indian boys, perhaps only a handful, often only very fleetingly recorded, but they were there. Sometimes archives help, giving us little glimpses through letters and financial accounts and legal reports. So we know, for instance, um, that in the damp, cold autumn of 1567, a weaver called Clement Byatt wrote back to his wife in Flanders. And he said, I have just arrived in Norwich and was joyfully received. There is good trade here and I will look after a house as quickly as I can get into business, for it will be easy to make money. Bring all your and your daughter's clothing, for people go well clad here. That fashion consciousness of the English also coming through again. And we know from legal records that just around the corner from here, that is where a little street is called Silver Street. Um, and that's where an Englishman, technically in Tudor days, he would be termed as a foreigner because he didn't live in London. He commuted between his hometown and London and conveniently didn't have to pay London taxes. Um, that this English foreigner lodged in the upstairs spare room of a middling Huguenot family in the late 1590s and early 1600s. We also know more importantly that he was close enough with his landlords to get involved in their ongoing family drama, which involved a pair of young lovers and a stingy father who refused to hand over the promised dowry. Um, the English lodger mediated and negotiated and testified, and we have his tes testimony in court, all between, in between writing plays like Othello, Measure for Measure, and King Lear. That's Shakespeare's signed deposition in the case of Bellow versus Mountjoy, when it finally came to the court in 1612, by the way. Of course, that kind of intermingling is bound to trigger anxiety, especially when loss rather than enrichment, erasure rather than a palimpsest is seen as an outcome. In this period, it quite often generated stories of paranoia and fear about those who voluntarily or involuntarily inhabited that charged, changing landscape. Take the strange case of Dr. Lopez, for instance. It's a story that pivots around a scandal which shook the country. The head of the state's own personal physician was a sleeper agent on the payroll of an enemy state. In January 1594, Rodrigo Lopez, doctor to Elizabeth I, and to many of her principal courtiers, was arrested by the Earl of Essex, the Queen's favorite. Essex later would write a boasting letter to one of his confidants, um, spelling out how he had stamped out this Spanish conspiracy. Its intended target had been Elizabeth herself, he says. The executioner should have been Dr. Lopez, he sensationally announced, the manner by poison. Lopez, very usefully for Essex, was a stranger. He had arrived in the country in 1559, the year when Thomas Gresham is knighted, by the way. Um, he was well-spoken, multilingual, well-connected. There was no real evidence of his guilt, but he was a plausible pawn in Essex's power struggle in the court thwarting a dastardly kind of Spanish plot that everyone else at the court had missed made Essex look good. Lopez was imprisoned at the tower and in June 1594, he was hanged, drawn and quartered. 
Elizabeth couldn't go against the decision of Lopez's trial, but the fact that she took months to sign the death warrant and returned his estate to his English wife and half English children suggests that she may not have been quite convinced about his guilt either. What we're more conscious of now, more than ever perhaps, what sings out from those dusty documentary evidence of court records and contemporary gossip is that what damned Rodrigo Lopez was uncertainty about his identity, his in-betweenness. Now, it's fairly well established that while the God-fearing people of the country sympathized with the plight of European religious refugees, many of them also felt anxious about the influx of foreigners, refugees or otherwise, and the way they, it changed their familiar world. It wasn't just a matter of foreign fashions and trends that made Englishmen the subject of ridicule. Some changes were far more basic, far more fundamental. Like Lucas and like Lopez, um, foreign migrants brought their own skills and professions with them. They set up shops, they competed with the locals what, for what was seen quite often as limited local resources. Occasionally, riots broke out as a result. The most famous of them was on 1st May 1517, when London apprentices attacked both rich foreign merchants and poor artisans um, and looted their shops and threw out their stock on the streets. Um, subsequently, it would be called Evil May Day. Sometimes, the anxiety bubbled onto the popular stage. In 1576, a play was performed called Tide Tarrieth No Man. And yes, I mean, Tudor titles are nothing if not catchy. Um, but this particular one is quite interesting because there's a man in it in one particular scene who is talking to an agent about buying a house. He likes what he sees, but there's one problem. I am but a stranger, he says. Won't the neighbors ob object to, you know, foreigners buying up property and pricing out the local English? Not in the least, says the agent. For among us now, such is our country's zeal that we love best with foreigners to deal. Regional and national powers that be struggled to tackle all these worries and issues, and they really got into elaborate legal tangles and messes. Who was a stranger? What rights did they have? They paid taxes. Did that mean that they could buy property? And what about their children? Were they strangers or were they English? And what happened when the first generation of strangers died? Would their children inherit the property, or should that go back to the state? because it's English money after all. And of course, particularly at times of national crisis, both strangers and their subsequent generations were seen as especially dangerous internal threats to national identity and security. Um, time for another catchy title of a Tudor play, this time a 1580s post-Armada play by Robert Wilson called The Three Lords and Three Ladies of London. This one has a scene in which a handful of villains, who are all personifications of various unsavory professions, are trying to convince a mate to side with an invading Spanish army. He's not too keen though, and he says, whatever ye do, be not traitors to your native country. But they remind him, tis not our native country, thou knowest I, Simony, am a Roman, dissimulation a mongrel, half an Italian, half a Dutchman, fraud, so too, half French and half Scottish. And thy parents were both Jews, though thou wert born in London. Essex's case against Rodrigo Lopez fed into all that tension and anxiety. It turned what might have been simmering under the surface, a frustration with a perceived invasion of an English way of life into the threat of a real invasion. What did it mean to settle in the country, to become an English subject, 
How could you know if someone truly belonged? Though Lopez conformed to the Anglican church, news and gossip about him um, kept zooming on to the one fact that he was a second generation Portuguese Mahano or new Christian, a Jew converted to Christianity. During Lopez's trial, the English repeatedly point out that he was a stranger and a Portugal, and therefore not to be trusted, obviously. Um, the Portuguese, on the other hand, were all too willing to distance themselves from him by claiming that he was a crypto-Jew. He wasn't a true Portuguese or indeed a Christian. If the mark of a successful immigrant is their ability and their willingness to get involved, to fit in, then it is a deep, tragic irony that it was that very ability to settle into multiple cultures and multiple languages and nations that made Lopez a citizen of nowhere. But before we start imagining that the traffic that threatened and shaped articulations of Englishness was only incoming, however, it's worth reminding ourselves that significant numbers of the English were of course going outwards as well, exactly in the same period. And they were driven by multiple imperatives, um, fashion, faith, some of them were also religious refugees, seeking shelter in European Catholic nations. Others headed towards the buzzing trade routes of the Middle East and Asia. They too were part of that fluid expanding world. And they too unsettled and sometimes radically challenged what it might mean to be English. In the years after Gresham, one person who would enter the history books and popular English theater was a notorious English pirate, and his name was John Ward. John Ward, AKA Jack Ward, or also known as Jack Birdie. And if you're wondering, then the answer is yes. You can see his shadow looming behind all the piratical Jack Sparrows of our present day film franchises. But John Ward also stood for all that horrified, worried, and still sneakily fascinated England in this period. Ward converted to Islam under the name of Yusuf Rais and retired with his wealth to Tunis under Ottoman protection. He even had a play written about him in 1612 called A Christian Turned Turk. And there, English theatre goers would see an Englishman on stage renounce his identity. What is it I lose by the, this my change, he says, my country? Already it is to me impossible. My name is scandaled. What is one island compared to the Eastern monarchy? Real life was possibly even stranger. In the June of 1586, William Harborn, who was the first English ambassador to Constantinople or Istanbul, the Ottoman court, wrote a letter which hints at what's probably one of my absolute favorite stories from this period. Now, Harborn was trying to make a very sensitive negotiation with the Ottomans. He was trying to free a group of English sailors who had been taken prisoner. The person who would decide the fate of the prisoners was the Ottoman governor or begler beg of Algiers, a man called Uluchali Pasha, but Harbon wasn't writing to him. His letter was addressed instead to the Pasha's treasurer, an, an eunuch called Asan Aga, but Harbon wrote to him as one Englishman to another. Referring to the biblical story of Joseph and his brothers in Egypt, he writes, I trust you be ordained another Joseph to follow his example in true piety in such sort that notwithstanding your body be subject to Turkish thraldom, yet your virtuous mind free from those vices. In return, he says that Asanaga would be promised the favor of his queen and country. We don't know whether the prisoners were ultimately freed and neither do we know what happened to Asanaga, the recipient of that letter. The only other trace of him is a chance portrait in a contemporary German traveler's notebook, looking back at us in full Turkish costume. 
But 13 years after Harbon wrote his letter, an English book would preserve a trace of who he was and who he used to be. Within the pages of Richard Hackleth's monumental collection of English travels called Principal Navigations, Voyages and Discoveries of the English Nav Nation, a whole history of adventure and captivity and transformation of a young man from Bristol, Samson Rowley, is condensed in one single terse headnote. To Hassan Aga, eunuch and treasurer to Hassan Bassa, king of Alger, which Hassan Aga was the son of Francis Rowley of Bristol Merchant, taken in the swallow. One final story I think um, we've got time for about that complicated and tangled story of global traffic and trade and the making of England and Englishness. It's the middle of summer and I am on a taxi ride from Panaji, which is the modern capital of Goa in Western India. And yes, this is the moment your worst nightmares have come true. I'm unleashing my summer holiday photos on you. <laughs> um, at the end of a good two hour bone jarring drive is a small secluded white building. During the monsoon rains last summer, it was surrounded by out of control greenery, lush and overwhelming. And you were greeted with what sounded like a serenade by about a thousand frogs as you got out of the car and rushed to the sheltered portico away from the driving rain. This is Rushall one of the earliest seminaries or training colleges for Christian missionaries in Asia. It was established in the, late, in the 16th century by the Jesuits to convert and civilize Portuguese-held Goa and the larger Portuguese empire in the Indies. It's still an active seminary, though no longer run by the Jesuits. Um, the journey in some ways was a step into unknown territory for me, it was a homecoming to the country where I had grown up, but not quite because Goa, which was under Portuguese rule till the 1960s, um, has always been slightly anomalous in the history of India. It was also stepping into a new medium. I had been to Rashol before as a researcher, but this time I was going with a recorder and mic wielding radio producer because I was going to make a radio documentary about one particular person. And that's pretty different from talking to friendly faces um, in situ. But as I said, I was in Goa in search of a man. In 1579, when Thomas Gresham was dying in London, another Thomas, a man called Thomas Stephens, landed in Goa. Now, Thomas Stephen fascinated me initially, originally because he's the first documented Englishman in India. But what grew to fascinate me even more, I think, was that Thomas Stevens was also a product of that fluid, changing England that we have been exploring. And his story exemplified some of the unpredictable ways in which that nexus of global traffic and trade and human mobility could complicate national identities, national allegiances. Stephenson's life reads like a kind of old-fashioned boy's own adventure, really. He was a Catholic who was seen as a potential traitor and troublemaker in Protestant England. Um, he narrowly avoided imprisonment when he fled to continental Europe. The person he was escaping the country with wasn't as lucky. He was captured and brought back to the Tower of England and essentially spent his entire life in captivity. But years later, um, when the first English trading ships arrived in India in 1583, and I'm talking 20 years before the East India Company was even born, the English merchants on that trading ship were promptly arrested, essentially for industrial espionage by the Portuguese. The Portuguese didn't like these Englishmen wandering around looking for trade in their stronghold. It seemed quite certain that these poor people would be shipped back to the Inquisition um, in Europe, and no one wants that. But Stephens, by then known as Padre Estevan, came to their rescue. He bailed them out and possibly helped them to escape. Why 
Was he unable to refuse help, thinking of the family and friends he had left behind in England? Or was he simply pleased to see his fellow countrymen? Did shared Englishness trump religious difference? In any case, thanks to Stephens, the small group of Englishmen would escape the Portuguese stronghold of Goa, and of that small party, at least one of them would return back to England eight years later to tell the story of their adventures in India. And soon after that, Elizabeth I gave permission for the establishment of the East India Company. So there's a contradiction. Stephens's help to her stranded fellow countrymen some of whom may have gladly seen him in the tower as a potential traitor if this was back home, stands right at the beginning of England's long and complex relationship with India, the jewel in Britain's later imperial crown. An even bigger contradiction emerged when I was looking more into Stephens's life in Goa. Stephens arrived in Goa shortly after the Portuguese had adopted what seems to be an almost kind of scorched earth, ground zero approach to local Hindu and Muslim religious religions and culture. Tearing down temples and mosques, banning the use of indigenous languages and customs from the singing of folk songs to rather weirdly, the cooking of rice. Um, but Stephens used his Jesuit missionary work as a rationale to defend his learning of regional languages, classical Marathi, fluid, poetic, high literary, and Konkani, the salty, fishy, colloquial lingo of the markets and the fishermen and the women at home. And it is here that 50 years before John Milton's Paradise Lost, the first Christian epic poem by an English poem, poet was written by Thomas Stevens in Marathi. It's a huge 11,000 11, verse tour de force called the Krista Purana or the life of Christ. And it was once read in every Goan Christian household and sung in every church. What are we to make of this? Thomas Stevens could be seen on the one hand as an example of one of those gung-ho examples of English agents of empire who populate some versions of English history. On the other, from a post-colonial perspective, we could say that his writing is an act of proto-colonial appropriation of indigenous cultures and imaginative spaces. But the reality is much more complex than that. Stephens and the writing of the Krista Purana is a palimpsest of place and identity and intent. This epic with its lyrical praise of Indian flora and fauna and language, written by this Englishman who himself had lost his place in England for a religion he wasn't allowed to practice. He offered it to people halfway across the world as a replacement for a way of life and systems of belief that ironically, he himself was helping to erase. Soon, the Krista Purana itself would be threatened with erasure. The Portuguese burnt every printed copy in an attempt to stamp down on indigenous languages. What happened next is another twist in the tale. The poem essentially goes underground. In villages and towns of 17th century Goa, it was painstakingly copied by hand, every one of its 11,000 verses, um, by the Goan Christians and sung in surreptitious, surreptitious gatherings. It became essentially a mark of Indian resistance against European colonial rule. Once a nearly erased text, the singing of a, a dying art Today, there are signs of it receiving a new shot of life, um, both from those interested in preserving Goan heritage and those who value it as part of an Indian literary tradition. And oddly enough, Thomas Stevens's identity as an Englishman doesn't really feature in either of those narratives. One of my most memorable encounters during that visit was to a children's club in a remote valley in Goa, where a young Indian Catholic priest taught the kids to sing the verses. It wasn't so much for religious education it emerged as it was an attempt to introduce Indian classical music into Christian worship. 
When Lucas de Heer sketched his sartorially confused Englishman, he was, as I had said, tapping into an old joke and an old fear. It was a fear about the instability of national identity at a time when an English, the idea of an English nation itself was seen as being under threat from internal and external forces alike. It was also a fear about foreign incursion. And as we have seen, that fear could leap very easily from a taste for Italian gloves or Spanish hats or Flemish silk to the rewriting of English space and English ways of life by foreign arrivals who were supplying those tastes to threats of a full-blown invasion. Yet people like Lucas and Lopez and Jack Ward and Thomas Stephens and Thomas Gresham himself all remind us that the story of the shaping of the nation in this particular age of trade and travels was far richer than that. They point to the multiple and multivalent ways in which such movements transformed the people caught up in its wake. And they eliminate how it transformed the country those people had variously adopted or rejected or yearned for or missed. The country whose identity, either directly or indirectly, they had helped to formulate and articulate. And seen in that light, Lucas's English figure might take on a different kind of agency, asserting his right to an identity that is deliberately and self-consciously heterogeneous, irreducibly and, well, unabashedly contrapuntal and complex. Thank you. <laughs>